So now we're both recording and live on YouTube. And Fernando, you want to start? Okay. I can okay. keep track and get more people, you know, coming in. So if you want to, I think we're going to have Michael first and Stephen. So if you want to present Michael and we have. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, we're thrilled of having uh, all of you here today for the panel discussion that is going to be lead, lead by uh, Professor Michael Lazada and uh, Professor Esteban Perez. This class, um, I mean, this uh, panel is part of our class, the IP class 211, uh, Memories of Neoliberalism. Um, so I would like to um, start by uh, introducing um, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Michael Lazada. Michael is a professor of Latin American literature and cultural studies and associate vice provost for academic programs in global affairs at the University of California, uh, Davis. He's the author of A Civil Obedience, Complicity and Complac Complacency in Chile since Pinochet, uh, Luz Arce and Pinochet's Chile, Testimony in the Aftermath of State Violence, and Chilean Transition, the Poetics and Politics of Memory, in addition to numerous articles and edited volumes on topics in memory, human rights, and culture. So we are super happy and thankful of having you, uh, Michael, with us uh, today. Great. Thank you so much uh, to Fernando, to Professor Blanco, to uh, uh, Pro Professor Vernengo for the kind invitation to be with all of you today. Thanks to everyone at Bucknell University. And I know people are joining from all over. So, uh, so thanks, thanks for being here. It's one of the the one, the one silver linings is that we we can travel easily through cyberspace to uh, enjoy different talks and and exchange ideas. So we look forward to uh, dialoguing with you all uh, af afterwards. Um, and it's a pleasure as well to be on this panel with uh, Esteban Perez. Uh, I think uh, having a panel uh, to talk about Chile that combines uh, the economic perspective with the more cultural perspective is a is a really interesting opportunity and, and juxtaposition. So. I'm going to start by uh, sharing, I'm, I'm gonna share my screen here because I have a PowerPoint. Uh, we'll get started with this. Can everybody see that okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Yep. And uh, let me just go to the start. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Uh, the title of my talk is Reckoning with Jaime Guzman and Pinochet. Complicity, Memory, and Revolt in Neoliberal Chile. So I want to start uh, with a, a more present moment. Uh, the October 18th, 2019 uh, revolt in Chile. On October 18th, 2019, a seemingly small thing, a 3% hike in subway fares, set off massive protests in the Chilean capital that quickly spread across the country. Subway stations were ransacked and people took to the streets in droves to protest the neoliberal model that had been put into place by the Pinochet regime, which we recall was from 1973 to 1990. A neoliberal model that had been nurtured for more than two decades as well by Chile's democratic governments. Pensions, healthcare, gender equality, indigenous rights and education were all key issues as was the need to do away with the 1980 constitution penned under dictatorship that continues to haunt Chile even to this day. Other protests had of course been happening for years, but in the context of a global resurgence of right-wing regimes, all of the pain points of the neoliberal model suddenly converged in what seemed to be a singular moment of revolt in which Chile, as many said, woke up. Chile despertó. Chile had become a powder keg in which discontent with inequality, racism, classism, sexism, xenophobia, and the marginalization of certain groups, including women, sexual minorities, immigrants, and indigenous peoples had clearly reached a breaking point. Almost immediately after the protest broke out, the right-wing president, Sebastián Piñera, declared a state of emergency. It was the first time that this had happened for political reasons since the 1990 return to democracy. This move quickly brought back memories of what we might call the bad old days, curfews, detentions, tear gas, rhetoric vilifying citizens and turning protesters into branded enemies of the state. 
the ghosts of the past came back with a vengeance in a new moment of danger. Rampant police brutality, the looting of homes, sexualized violence, torture, the criminalization of protest, maiming, and of course, the most emblematic violation of all, the loss of eyes, blinding by rubber bullets that the police rained down on the crowds. By December 2019, the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights had issued a report stating that more than 28,000 people had been detained between October 2019 and December 2020 in just uh, those months, signaling a human rights crisis of massive proportions. Today, Chile is and isn't a different place. In a late October 2020 referendum, nearly 80% of Chileans voted to do away with the 1980 constitution, perhaps the most salient symbol of the dictatorship's protracted grip on society. Over the next couple of years, this constitutional process will unfold, assuredly leading to greater degrees of democracy and inclusion. Still, as I mentioned before, the ghosts of the past loom large. The weight of authoritarianism, though certainly unraveled and undone in many ways, remains very much encoded on the DNA of certain members of the elite political class and can rear its ugly head in certain moments of threat. People complicit with the Pinochet regime continue to hold positions of power, and many human rights violators of the past and of the present still roam free in impunity despite many advances and years and decades of valiant efforts by human rights activists. In short, if we think of Chile right now, we can say that the country seems perched on a precipice for change as the world waits and watches to see the extent to which the legacies of Pinochet and his civilian accomplices will be laid to rest. Taking up a thread uh, in this talk from my book, Civil Obedience, Complicity and Complacency in Chile Since Pinochet, uh, which was published in 2018, I'd like to reflect a little bit this evening through cultural production and reference to a couple of films in particular about one particular ghost that's been particularly hard to keep at bay. That is the ghost of Jaime Guzman Errazuriz, neoliberal Chile's founding ideologue, the principal author of the 1980 constitution, a man vehemently hated by the left and martyred by the right after he was assassinated in 1991 at the hands of the left-wing group Frente Patriotico Manuel Rodriguez. A staunchly Catholic man who according to more than one source also grappled with a closeted homosexuality, by all accounts, one of the most influential figures in the design of contemporary Chile perhaps one might argue even more so than Pinochet. After a, a few brief words about Guzman, uh, just to kind of, for those who might know, uh, not know as well who he is, uh, I, I'll then turn to focusing on two films that in a way grapple with the specter of Jaime Guzman and in which that specter surfaces either directly or indirectly. The first of these films is Chicago Boys, which I know some of the students, uh, in, uh, in the class have seen. Uh, it's a 2015 film by Carola Fuentes and Rafael Valdeavellano, which foregrounds the present day first person memories of five Chilean economists who trained at the University of Chicago under Milton Friedman and played key roles in Chile's neoliberal counter-revolution. My focus will be, and here I'm picking up on a term uh, that I use in my book, uh, it will be on the what, what I call the fictions of mastery that Guzman's contemporaries create to account for and in a way to justify their past actions and commitments. And the second film that I'll talk about is called El Tio, uh, which came out in 2013 by director Mateo Irribarren. And it's produced by and stars Jaime Guzman's biological nephew, uh, a man named Ignacio Santa Cruz, who plays the role of his uncle in the film. In the film, a member of Guzman's own family struggles to come to terms with his uncle's legacy. The film, I think, shows uh, quite interestingly how younger generations are trying to break free from the chains of the past, though not without angst and not without consequences. The juxtaposition of these two films will allow me also to talk a bit about the fraught memories and ethical dilemmas of the political right, 
in particular, and it will help me to draw a contrast between how Guzman's own contemporaries are remembering their founding father versus how a younger generation is starting to take steps toward a more thorough, though sometimes, at least in the case of this figure on the right, admittedly incomplete reckoning uh, with this critical, but still somewhat enigmatic figure. So let me start a bit with Jaime Guzman, uh, 1946 to 1991 uh, were the years of his life. And he has gone down in history, as I mentioned before, as the Pinochet regime's most influential civilian collaborator. As the author of key documents, such as the dictatorship's 1974 Declaration of Principles and Pinochet's infamous 1977 speech on Chacarillas Hill and Santiago, in which he advocated for a quote, authoritarian, protected, integrated, and technophile democracy, Guzman played really a decisive role in creating and promoting the unique marriage of neoliberalism with authoritarianism that would shape Chile throughout the 1980s and beyond. Even more importantly, as the lead author of the 1980 constitution, he would be responsible for designing and institutionalizing what political scientists have called the authoritarian enclaves of that constitution, designated senators, the now defunct binomial electoral system, et cetera, which really cemented the Pinochet regime's legacy for many years and haunted Chilean politics long after the 1990 transition to democracy. Guzman emerged as a leader in the late 60s when he was studying at the Catholic University Law School. In 1967, he founded a movement known as Gremialismo, which proved to be a powerful magnet for conservative youth and that would eventually attract many individuals who after the 73 coup would become some of the most important civilian and economic advisors to the dictatorship, as well as some of the most stalwart proponents and promoters of the, of the Chicago-inspired uh, neoliberal agenda. As an advisor and a speechwriter and a media presence throughout the dictatorship, Guzman was one of the most vocal promoters, for example, of the idea that on the 11th of September, 1973, Pinochet and the military had saved the country from the brink of a civil war. His voice and personal writings thus mark a point of origin in a long genealogy of attempts by the right since the coup to separate the laudable, uh, entre comillas, quote unquote, the laudable neoliberalization of the economy, as well as the establishment of peace and order from the human rights violations on which the economic overhaul of the country was founded. Inspired by Hayek's idea of the liberal dictator, Guzman believed that authoritarian regimes could paradoxically increase people's freedom and degree of choice by overtly limiting other freedoms. His argument was ultimately utilitarian in nature. It held that sometimes certain lives and freedoms had to be sacrificed for the greater good. As heirs to that utilitarian logic, hardline Pinochetistas still argue today that Pinochet should be remembered as the good cold warrior because he managed to eliminate the Marxist threat with far fewer deaths than in Argentina, Guatemala, or other countries of the region. Guzman's writings revealed that human rights were a deeply uncomfortable subject for him, a paradox, caught between an unwavering commitment to promoting neoliberalism and an awareness that human rights violations were happening Guzman elaborated a set of arguments which can be found in, uh, for example, this compilation that you see on, his, on the screen, his Escritos Personales or Personal Writings, in which he claims that it's sometimes necessary to violate human rights in order to protect certain natural rights of the individual, most notably the right to private property. At the same time, he claims that out of a moral duty and sensitivity to the human rights crisis, he occasionally exercised his political influence to shield political prisoners from harm. These details make it clear, as Christian Gasmuri has argued, that Guzman was a man whose beliefs evinced a kind of ductile morality necessary to navigate the murky political waters of his time. Guzman also was always a strategist and a pragmatist. His strategic decision in the mid 80s to repudiate the former head of the secret police, Manuel Contreras, and to publicly take distance from Pinochet 
proved politically expeditious. Guzman believed that as soon as the regime's legacy had been memorialized in the 1980 constitution, Chile would be best served to move on, to move forward toward a more impersonal brand of authoritarianism disconnected in the popular imagination from the figure of the dictator. URI, uh, Unión Democrática Independiente, the political party that Guzmán founded in 1983, would function as the primary conduit for achieving this goal, perpetuating Pinochetismo without Pinochet. So with this in mind, I would say that perhaps it becomes possible to read the history of the right in Chile since the 80s as an attempt to honor Pinochet's work while also seeking to break free from the dictator's ghost that was no longer politically or tactically expedient for the, for the civilians who would carry on his legacy. The now commonplace gen gesture of mentally parsing Pinochet the violent dictator from his neoliberal counter-revolution thus began in a way with Guzman. And after Guzman, many other politicians and figures of the right have similarly tried to disavow Pinochet the criminal while hypocritically celebrating his economic transformation of the country. So now let me turn to the, to the first of the films, uh, Chicago Boys. Uh, and uh, this, is a, this is a film where I, I want to really hone in on one figure in particular, uh, a man named Sergio de Castro, uh, who you can see here. De Castro was a professor of economics at the Catholic University and Dean of the Economic School from 1965 to 1968. And he became a powerful thought leader and highly influential figure within the Pinochet regime. Having studied at the University of Chicago starting in 1956, after the coup, this first generation Chicago boy stood at the ready to eviscerate the Chilean welfare state and impose an alternative economic model rooted in pure and an unbridled belief in the free market. As the principal author of the regime's economic policy, known as El Ladrillo, or the brick, also pictured here, which provided a counteroffensive to Allende's deprivatization initiatives, de Castro would play a central role in selling the merits of the free market to Pinochet as a cure for the country's dire economic situation. To a certain extent, Pinochet's alliance with de Castro was a relationship of convenience much like de Castro's alliance with Jaime Guzman. Guzman and de Castro met each other in the hallowed halls of the Catholic University in the mid 60s. The two were immediately drawn to one another by certain natural affinities, their staunchly Catholic beliefs, their shared conservative and traditionalist background, their skepticism about democracy, their hatred of socialism, and their adherence to authoritarianism as the best way to correct what they saw as a chaotic situation. Their relationship personally would only grow stronger with time, especially because de Castro saw in Guzman a vehicle for institutionalizing politically his bold ideas about the economy. By marrying his own neoliberal fervor with Guzman's political savvy and Pinochet's ruthlessness, de Castro seized an opportunity to secure a victory for economic freedom, quote unquote. After Guzman's murder in 1991, de Castro would continue to push his neoliberal ideas, serving as an economic advisor to Udi, uh, the political party, and helping the party to market a public image of itself as the one most responsible for Chile's, quote, economic miracle and modernizing transformation. So if we think about the film and the way de Castro appears there, how does he look back on his life and grapple with what I've called Guzman's paradox? The directors provide important insights for answering this question. The film, uh, for those who have seen it, foregrounds the voices of five Chicago boys, uh, slating de Castro really in the role of key informant. On one level, the film traces a history of the Chicago boys' formative years, but nevertheless, I think its primary goal is not historical. Rather, it seeks to highlight how Pinochet's economic advisors in the here and now rationalize their involvements with the regime and, and, with the regime and understand the legacy of their work vis-a-vis -vis -vis the regime's human rights violations. 
the Chicago Boys retelling of their past and their beginnings reads really like a Horatio Alger story. When University of Chicago professor Arnold Harberger first arrived in Chile in 1955, offering De Castro and others an opportunity to study at the University of Chicago, the young men jumped at the chance to better their lot in life and escape their, as one of the men says in the film, their third world destiny. Ernesto Fontaine, one of the other figures in the film, remarks that when he first met Professor Harberger, he immediately took notice of Harberger's handsome yellow shirt, coveting it as an object that, that could only be obtained in the first world. Fontaine adds that such a beautiful shirt is something that one would never have seen in Chile. Several other Chicago boys muse about how poor they were when they first went to study in the United States. In reality, we know that most of them came from middle or upper class families. And they also muse about how life in the US opened their eyes to realities that were different and stoked their desire to wage the capitalist counter-revolution in Chile. The Chicago boys foundational fiction therefore hinges on a vision of the self staked on material wealth. Possessing that beautiful yellow shirt metonymically defines the identity to which these self-made men uh, as aspired. From early on, the Chicago boys, as we see in the film, also began to think of themselves in a way as apolitical beings. Doing so was indeed necessary for them to emerge as neoliberal men and to construct an identity, casting themselves in the role of economic heroes and crusaders. To that end, De Castro observes in the film that, quote, in Chicago, we never talked about politics. We never tried to poison the minds of other Chileans who went to study there. <laughs> to be born then as the Chicago boys, as the neoliberal subjects par excellence, required that these men forsake their political subjectivities and embrace their role as free marketeers with an almost religious fervor. The sociologists Katia Araujo and Danilo Martuccelli argue that redefining the Chilean citizen as what they call homo neoliberal or neoliberal man was one of the Pinochet regime's main objectives after its economic program had been consolidated in the mid 70s. To revolutionize Chilean society not only meant overhauling the economy in formal terms, but also redefining citizenship. It meant conquering hearts and conquering minds. The UDI politician Joaquin Lavin, in a well-known book uh, whose cover you see on the screen here, called Chile, Una Revolución Silenciosa, A Quiet Revolution from 1987, speaks directly to this objective when he writes, quote, over the last decade from 77 to 87, Chile has experienced profound change, transformations that are modifying the ways in which new generations of Chileans live, think, study, work, and rest, the way they dress, the food they buy, the way they spend their time, the cities in which they prefer to live, the majors they, cho they choose in school, everything is changing. It's the end of the quote. Although Araujo and Martuccelli, writing after the 2011 student protest, claim that Chileans today are socially minded and valiantly resist the impetus to become homo neoliberal, they are also mindful that the dictatorship's utopian vision for society involved creating a depoliticized citizen consumer whose every activity and thought would ideally be geared toward the market. When we consider the narratives that De Castro and the other Chicago boys offer in this film, it's clear that to frame themselves as homo neoliberal constitutes a powerful fiction of mastery that allows them to preserve a heroic vision of the self and alleviate the anxieties that derive from Guzman's paradox. In the later sequences of the film where the human rights question really emerges, for example, pressed by the filmmakers to account for his complicity, De Castro makes state statements such as the ones that you see here. I never knew of anyone who had been killed or mistreated. When people would talk about those kinds of things, i.e. human rights violations, I thought they were lies. Many times I attended meetings of the World Bank or the IMF, and I had friends in the US State Department, and they would say, look, in Chile, there is repression and torture and this and that, but frankly, I didn't believe them. Unconvinced by these statements, 
the filmmakers' voices intervene and ask De Castro if, upon returning to Chile from any such meetings, he ever asked Pinochet if the rumors that he was hearing were true. De Castro predictably denies ever having spoken, spoken about human rights with Pinochet. He adds, quote, I never asked him because I was part of the economic thing. Yo estaba en la cosa económica, he says, and I had my own problems. Why would I want to go looking for other kinds of problems? So we see that he adopts a sort of don't ask, don't tell mentality, hiding behind his comfortable role as an economist. In a sense, the Castro and the other Chicago boys remain frozen in time, clinging to a heroic crusader dis discourse to justify their existence. But patently heroic memories such as theirs are almost like relics now and no longer tolerable to most Chileans. Times are clearly changing, and the salvationist lines of discourse that made sense or found significant degrees of resonance in a Cold War or post-Cold War context have now ceased to be convincing to most people. Such memories, however, linger there obstinately on the scene, colliding with those of younger generations who are even more uncomfortable with the legacies of the past. So now let me say a few words by way of contrast about the other film, El Tío, from 2013, a film which, as I had said earlier, places center stage a nephew's process of reckoning with his uncle's ghost, a process whose principal dynamic is to explore the blurred lines that separate fact from fiction and history from myth. In the film, the character Ignacio, an actor by trade, sets out to become Jaime Guzman, that means to play the role of his uncle so fully and so authentically that he might be able to understand something deeper about this ghost that has haunted him and his country since childhood. Ignacio really obsesses over Guzman's ghost in ways that often seem unhealthy. A case in point, he attempts to dress, speak, and even think like Guzman. And this becomes so all-consuming that when his boyfriend Julio breaks up with him, it's because he's unable to tolerate it when Ignacio channels his uncle's voice in bed after sex. Metacinematic gestures permeate El Tio from start to finish. More than a film about Guzman himself, what the viewer really is seeing is a film about the making of a play titled Guzman a play directed by the same director, Irri Barren, and starring the same actor, Santa Cruz, which actually is a real play that existed and enjoyed a short run in Santiago in 2011. So life, theater, and cinema therefore illuminate one another in a clever game of mise en abîme. This game helps us to understand the role that myth-making plays in history as well as the set to sense the psychic hold that Guzman has on his descendants. Making the play and the film, however, are anything but easy for Ignacio. He's met with scorn by just about every actor who he approaches to take part in the project. In a very humorous sequence toward the beginning of the film, for example, he goes to the director's apartment and asks Irribarren if he'll write a play about Guzman. The director is dumbfounded by the request and he reacts viscerally, telling the actor to get lost. But after a significant amount of hemming and hawing, Irribarren agrees to write and eventually direct the play, mainly because no one else will do it. He peers down sheepishly at a Salvador Allende t-shirt that he's wearing, and he mutters, my mother is going to kill me for doing this. Hmm. How to portray Guzman then becomes the major dilemma for Santa Cruz in the film, because he's torn between family loyalty on the one hand and on the other hand, a commitment to verisimilitude. Here's a, a very telling uh, quick exchange between the director and the actor. Santa Cruz says, I don't want to do anything to extol my uncle or whitewash his image. Irribarren replies to him, well, to manage that, you'd have to have been born into some other family. And Santa Cruz says, but I don't want to crucify him either. A happy medium. The film, though critical of Guzman in a lot of ways, ultimately opts for what I would call a poetics of ambiguity regarding certain aspects of the historical figure, both public and private. For example, regarding Guzman's position on human rights violations, 
El Tio, in a very similar way to some written sources on Guzman, raises the question of whether Chile's neoliberal ideologue ever intervened on behalf of political prisoners, but affirms that there's no real proof that he did. Guzman's purported homosexuality also receives ambiguous treatment in the film. Throughout El Tio, different characters opine as to whether or not Jaime Guzman was gay, leaving open to speculations, questions as to whether Guzman could have had an intimate relationship with former president Jorge Alessandri. In contrast to the asexualized image that both Udi and Guzman's sister Rosario Guzman have wanted to paint of him for historical posterity, the ideologue's nephew suggests that his uncle was gay, quote, in orientation, but not in practice. In an interview with Caras magazine, he points to another paradoxical aspect of Guzman's figure that both he and Irribarren try to capture in the film. And this is a quote from the interview uh, with, with Santa Cruz. He says, quote, we suggest that the most traditional Chilean figure of the last 60 years, Jaime Guzman, was essentially a liberal at heart, un liberal del alma. And that despite this inner liberalism, he created also the harshest and most conservative thing that we have in our country, the constitution. So Guzman's sexuality, like his stance on human rights, thus become keys to reading him as a conflicted, tormented, paradoxical and ambiguous historical figure. In a sense, the figure of a, the secret hovers around Guzman's homosexuality and becomes metonymic of a larger air of secrecy surrounding the Chilean transition. Understood as a metaphor, the film urges us to reflect on the secrets that have pervaded Guzman's family, the political right, the military, the concertacion, the nueva mayoría, etc., and becomes hyper, hyper emblematic of the pacts between left and right that founded the transition. When secrets are kept and pacts are made, the hypermasculine homonormative order remains undisturbed. Said in a little bit of a different way, Guzman's sexuality had to be repressed for the foundational fiction of Pinochet's Chile to take hold. In this sense, the ghost of Guzman's unresolved sexuality in El Tio becomes one strategy for questioning that fiction and laying bare, perhaps partially, certain unspoken pacts. And furthermore, as Professor Blanco uh, might suggest, it allows us to discover, quote, the imaginary matrix that hides the direction of social desire in Chile's post-democracy. That is a desire for higher degrees of equality, recognition of rights, and a deepening of democracy, but that's covered over by the implotments of certain hyper-conservative, publicly circulated, and also legitimized memory narratives. Santa Cruz comes from a new generation, one that grew up under dictatorship and that inherited Pinochet's legacy without being directly responsible for the coup or the situation that led to it. Like other artists, he certainly takes distance from his, artist, uh, from his object of inquiry. Acting and performativity become ways of trying on and testing questions and subject positions whose answers might prove uncomfortable if they were addressed more directly. I find this gesture toward performance very compelling in El Tio because through it, we see a younger generation rehearsing the past, bringing it up close and channeling it vicariously so as to gain a better grip on it. To that end, we see younger actors exploring questions in the film, such as what was it like to experience torture or what was it like to be General Pinochet or General Contreras or Jaime Guzman? While older actors that we see in the film resist playing these roles, younger actors seem to embrace the challenge. Of course, making this film was very costly uh, in a personal sense for Ignacio Santa Cruz. Everyone in his family, except for his mother, alienated him for doing it. And he was thoroughly chided by his uncle's political cronies who did everything they could to block the film's distribution. Yet despite the costs and despite the boldness of Santa Cruz's personal and artistic endeavor, I sort of wondered when I saw this film for the first time, if the deconstruction that happens in the film of Jaime Guzman is really bold enough. I had a chance to interview Santa Cruz uh, in Santiago in 2015 
And I put to him the question uh, that was very direct and I thought a simple one. I asked him, is Chile today better off because a man named Jaime Guzman existed? Or would it have been better if he had never played a role in shaping the direction that the country would take? Of course, he was startled by the question and he paused. And after a moment, he answered by saying, it's difficult to answer you because Jaime Guzman is my uncle and he always will be. He then went on to tell me that the 1980 constitution made Chile economically competitive, both regionally and in the world, giving it an edge with respect to other Latin American countries. However, at the same time, he added, and this is another quote uh, from the interview, he said, but that constitution was inscribed on a foundation of hundreds of cadavers. Dangerously, as I listened to him, the well-worn discourse of Chilean exceptionalism, the ideas, ideas like Chile being an economic tiger or the so-called jaguar of Latin America lurked behind these words. In the final assessment then, my thought that was, was that Santa Cruz was willing to disavow certain aspects of his uncle's persona, but the disavowal was not complete enough. Just like those who mentally compartmentalized Pinochet the criminal from Pinochet the savior of the economy, Santa Cruz compartmentalized his uncles in a way that was advantageous to his own view of himself as a neoliberal, who perhaps like his uncle, though much more openly, of course, understands himself to be, quote, a liberal at heart. So just by way of conclusion, uh, I wanted to evoke uh, a book since I've talked a bit about ghosts in the, in the talk, um, a book by Avery Gordon uh, that was published in 1997, Ghostly Matters, Haunting and the Sociological uh, Imagination. And in this book, Gordon reminds us, quote, if we want to study social life well, and if in addition we want to contribute in however small a measure to changing it, we must learn how to identify hauntings and to reckon with ghosts. We must learn how to make contact with what, with what is without a doubt often painful, difficult, or unsettling. The ghosts of conquest, colonialism, imperialism, socialism, neoliberalism, and other constructs, of course, continue to vex Chile as a social totality. Ghosts mediate relationships among individuals and institutions, social structures, subjects, histories, and biographies in ways that are often difficult or messy to sort out. Part of the critic's job, as Gordon suggests, is to lay bare all of these hauntings by identifying the motivations, underpinnings, and discursive constructions that shape narratives about violence and why it happens. This in a way is what I've tried to do today in this talk. So let me finish with an image and a, an example, uh, that of Udi, the political party that Guzman founded that I mentioned earlier. If we examine it closely, Udi today finds itself caught between an old guard, the people they call Los Coroneles, unwilling to relinquish power, even to save themselves from political destruction, and a new guard whose discourse is somewhat more progressive, yet still reluctant to turn its back on the benevolent fathers completely. One figure that comes to mind is uh, someone who's in the lower house of the Chilean Congress, uh, the deputy Jaime Belolio, who was born in 1980, one of the younger generation of Chicago boys also studied there, a member of the Jaime Guzman Foundation, but also someone who's been willing to challenge the old guard in his public discourse. His discourse broadly conceived emphasizes a need for Udi to adapt to the new Chile, lest the party become a relic and disappear. Perhaps predictably, this willingness to cast off or downplay some of his party's foundational memory scripts has been met with disapproval by several of the founding fathers of Chilean gremialismo. In a recent interview, Belolio claimed that Chile today is caught between two historical cycles, one linked to the Cold War and a new cycle linked to change that has not been made fully manifest yet. Both Ignacio Santa Cruz, who claim, claims to be of the left, but who cannot escape his familial links to the right and his neoliberal beliefs, and Belolio, who sees a need for change, but also harbors loyalty to Guzman and the economic model, embody, I think, the rub between these two historical moments. 
So on the one hand, these are figures that channel the incessant ghostly hauntings that engendered them, either biologically or politically, and that to a certain extent determine their words. On the other hand, they're expressions of a desire to forge a new voice that confronts these ghosts to conjure them away because doing it is vital to their political survival. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we now pass to the second talk. We're gonna leave the questions uh, for the end. And so everybody will be able uh, to have questions for both Michael and Esteban. So our second talk, uh, we uh, turn to from the cultural aspects uh, of neoliberalism in Chile to the um, economic aspects of neoliberalism in Chile. And uh, we have uh, from Chile, he's talking from Santiago, uh, which we thank because it's uh, two hours later than us, um, Esteban Perez Caldente. Esteban is uh, uh, the chief of the Financing for Development Unit at the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, he worked for, for other offices uh, of the UN in Mexico and in Trinidad Tobago uh, before going to Santiago. Um, he, um, he's the um, co-editor of the Review of Keynesian Economics and the New Paul Grave Dictionary uh, of Economics. Uh, has many books and journals. Uh, I cite uh, more recently uh, a book on um, why Latin American economies fail uh, by California University Press and uh, intellectual biography of Roy Harrod, who was the biographer of John Maynard Keynes, uh, published by Paul Grave Macmillan in the collection Great Thinkers in Economics. Um, and um, and Esteban, uh, I should say, uh, I didn't say that at the beginning, Esteban has a PhD from the New School for Social Research. So, so that puts him, I suppose, far away from neoliberal economists. Uh, and, and he, I, Esteban, you correct me, but you and your family were in Chile in Santiago at the time of the coup and the family uh, had to leave. So he, like Fernando, has a, a personal experience with, uh, with the uh, dictatorship in Chile. So uh, without further ado, I think you, you should be able to share the screen if you uh, want to do so and in case you have a PowerPoint. Okay, well, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Matias and Fernando for the invitation and uh, it's a pleasure to share the, the talk with, uh, with Michael. Uh, I'm going to share my, my screen and I'm going to be talking about, the, as Matias says, about the economic aspects of uh, uh, the uh, neoliberalism in Chile. Uh, the title of my talk is Reflections on Chile's Economic Model and its Consequences. Uh, and I'm going to start talking about Chile's neoliberal agenda. Uh, as we all know, uh, Chile abandoned uh, its uh, state-led development model in the 1970s that started uh, before the Allende years, actually started in the 1960s and embarked on a free market outward oriented strategy focused on stabilization, liberalization and the extended privatization of the productive apparatus during the Allende years, as uh, you, most of you know, uh, there was a, a movement towards nationaliz nationalization of the means of uh, production. The country consolidated its reform process in the mid 80s following several setbacks, major financial crises during 1981 and 1983, including during uh, the, the years of uh, Castro as a central banker, I think a minister of I uh, was central banker, as uh, head of the central bank, and it is this reform process, in fact, that has guided economic policy to the present day. Uh, the uh, well, I'm going to argue, I think Michael mentioned this, that the economic model did not uh, suffer significant changes uh, after uh, Pinochet, after the 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 start of the democratic process in, uh, in the early 1990s. And I would like to talk a little bit about Pinochet's creation by quoting Jacobo Timmerman, 
uh, from uh, Death in the South. And I think Jacobo uh, Timmerman really hit on the nail when he uh, distinguished what was the Pinochet's creation in terms of the dictatorship. I think it's quite related to what Michael was saying from other type of dictatorships. It, and I'm going to read the quote. He said the Chilean dictatorship did not carry out an activity that has been generally characteristics of dictatorship. It has not indulged in what Latin America called pharaonic works. Consumerism was the great pharaonic work of Pinochet. He kept the country happy for almost 10 years with color television sets from Hong Kong, dolls from Taiwan, automobiles from Japan, electronic games and computers from the United States. The entire world was happy to provide the no less Chilean happy Chileans, the happy Chileans with exotic fruits. Indeed, the only pharaonic work was the invention in Chile of corruption by consumption. The energies of the majority of the population were spent uh, on consumption. Meanwhile, torture and murder was a response to the heroism of the few Chileans who were not seduced by Pinochet's creation. And I think this is a ghost that haunts Chilean society. Consumerism and something which is attached to consumerism that has prevailed in Chilean society for a very long time, for decades, centuries, which is class, uh, a class classism and a class-based society. Chile's neoliberal agenda, as uh, um, I said before, privileged commercial financial liberalization, uh, maintaining the what they call the macroeconomic equilibrium. And in practice, this agenda was implemented through four channels promotion of privatization, and as you can see it in, the, in even in Pinochet's constitution, making health, education, and so on private as beyond the means of production, increased flexibility of the productive apparatus, uh, 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 at the achievement of fiscal balance over the business cycle, greater external commercial and financial integration with the rest of the world, and a subsidiary state. Uh, and the, uh, the role of the state during the Pinochet years was much, much reduced. There were important, uh, uh, important uh, 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 things done, uh, uh, let's say, successes, if we can call that during the Pinochet years, uh, were the reduction of poverty and so on. But in fact, the state, in terms of health, in terms of education, became extremely subsidiary as education and health were essentially services that were privatized. Uh, uh, this is uh, a uh, uh, data on the functional classification of total expenditure by governments from 1990 to 2010, uh, which start in 1990 and move on to Bachelet. And this, these are the post uh, uh, Pinochet years before uh, the, uh, the government of Piñera uh, which show basically two uh, Christian democratic governments, Alwin and Frey, and two socialist uh, government. And you will see that there's no much, there's not a lot of, of, uh, of differences in terms of the functional classification of income, whether it's social functions, maybe a little bit towards Bachelet, but less than in Frey. Uh, there was some spending in health, Housing was about the same. Social protection remained about the same. Education was very similar to the frame, maybe a little bit more, but there was no really improvement in terms of uh, public expenditure toward developmental needs of uh, the uh, population. And if you take into account uh, 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 or you compare public spending on primary education as percentage of total spending uh, in, for example, Chile, you would see that it's much lower with the exception of Brazil than in Paraguay, than in Peru, than in uh, uh, um, maybe a, a little bit higher than in Argentina or than in Colombia. So at the same time, let's say, where Chile was portrayed as an economic miracle, 
and a free market mirable it was a, a poster boy of neoliberalism actually what the data shows it's a very poor management of the social and developmental needs of the population uh, uh, a second uh, 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 way through which uh, the uh, this neoliberal agenda was implemented was through privatization uh, and privatization, as I said before, increased its uh, influence over the main sectors of productive activity, agriculture, mining, manufacturing, and also services. Min mining, which was nationalized uh, by the Allende government, eventually became a, uh, a, uh, became a private activity. And as I will show you, uh, the, uh, the public uh, use of mining uh, was, uh, was oriented towards capturing rents, economic rents for, uh, the, military, uh, for, the, for the military in Chile to, to build up uh, the, the army, the armed forces, the navy, and the air force. Uh, in the particular case of mining, in spite of the fact that the constitution gives explicit ownership of all mines to the Chilean state, the existing system of concessions had granted the you know, de facto control of the mining activity to the private sector. The private sector also operates the majority ownership of telecommunications, financial transport services, and as I said before, social services such as health, education, and pension have all also come under uh, private hands. The fiscal policy, uh, which uh, is uh, the third, uh, let's say, uh, a pillar uh, that characterizes e this economic neoliberal agenda was basically uh, um, um, uh, administered in, in terms of to control as external, external risk of the credit rating of the economy and provide the required fiscal space for the functioning of monetary policy. In Chile, there's a fiscal rule and monetary policy has the prerogative to maintain price stability. The fiscal rule makes it fairly difficult in Chile to really undertake counter cyclical uh, uh, fiscal policies relative to the uh, behavior of, of GDP. And then besides fiscal policy, also uh, the, uh, the Chilean neoliberal model was based on increased commercial and financial integration with the rest of the world. Uh, in fact, today, Chile has about 25 commercial agreements with more than 58 trade partners. Uh, in terms of the, the real economy, uh, the model, a neoliberal model uh, led to the increased specialization uh, based on natural resources and in comparative advantage. Natural resources and mining, which represented about 15% of GDP in the 1980s, increased to 23%. Natural resources and mining represent about 75% and 50% of total exports of goods and services and investment is uh, driven by, uh, by mining and natural resource exploitation also is a way to capture foreign direct in, uh, investment. Uh, moreover, natural resources also contribute to maintain fiscal stability and it's an important generator of fiscal, of fiscal revenues. Here you have a uh, graph that shows the rate of variation of GDP, of economic growth, which is in, uh, in gray, and the uh, rate of variation in the copper price, which is in blue. And you see that in the late 1990s, uh, the relation between the rate of growth of GDP and the rate of growth of copper prices have become more pronounced. They have a much more close association over time. And this is a reflection of this comparative advantage where you become uh, more and more uh, dependent or highly dependent uh, on the natural resource space without having the proper diversification that a lot of developed economies uh, have. The use of copper revenues has always been an issue in Chile because it was uh, copper revenues 
the part that was state owned by the Pinochet, Pinochet government was used to strengthen the military potential of the country. There was a law passed in 1973. It was modified in 1985, where the armed forces were entitled to receive 10% of all the value of the copper exports of the state-owned minor company. One could imagine that these uh, rents, these revenues could have been used for education, for health, but instead uh, they were built to keep actually the military happy. Uh, fiscal stability has also been used to for sovereign wealth funds, but it's all, all, all but it's uh, just a use to maintain basically financial stability rather than to provide copper funds for the uh, for education, health, or for productive services. The uh, the result of this neoliberal agenda, you see. You can see it in these indicators. This is a, a, a table that shows selected economic and social indicators by decade from the 1980s to 2010, 2019 for growth and income, the composition of economic activity, as I was mentioning, productivity growth, and also poverty and inequality. And if you look at the growth trend of GDP, you will see that since the democratic governments have taken have, have taken over and in fact from my point of view have in fact reinforced uh the uh the pinochet economic model with let's say uh, uh with human rights and with some state intervention where it's very patchy state intervention a subordinate uh, uh a state relative to the to the private sector the rate of growth has tended to decline. The rate of growth on average was about 6.6% and it has decreased to 29 And I think it has further decreased in 2020, obviously as a result of the pandemic. If you look at, uh, at uh, natural resources, you will see that mining has really increased from the, it represented 9% of GDP and increased to about 20% and close to 20% in the in the 2000s, yet manufacturing, which provides the industrial basis of a country, has tended to decrease from 20.8% of GDP to about 10% of, uh, of GDP. And the other uh, sector that has really experienced growth and important, let's say, expansion besides manufacturing is finance, financial activities. They represent about 20% of, uh, of GDP. So if you look at the Chilean model, Chilean model uh, is character, the Chilean model is characterized by a decline in the growth trend accompanied by an uh, 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 increased and high uh, importance of natural resources and in particular mining, decline in the industrial basis of the country and increase in financial activities. And the fact that manufacturing has experienced a decline in terms of its importance in GDP, you can also see it in productivity growth that has really declined. And you can look at this and you can say, well, what are, what are the successes of the Chilean model? And one can look at the successes of the Chilean model in terms of poverty, the reduction of poverty, that the 45% to 14% of the total population, that was always uh, uh, mentioned and was always argued by Pinochet economies how they reduce poverty and how the GDP per capita increased. Obviously, the increase in GDP per capita, that is uh, the, the flow of in, the value of the flow of income and of goods and services that a nation produces over a year, divided by the number of, uh, by the population increased from about 5,000 to 14,000. And uh, uh, today, Chile, uh, starting in, the, in uh, 2012, is considered a high income country, although it does have uh, the composition of sectors, the economic structure still of a developing country with some worrying trends, such as decline in productivity growth, and as I mentioned before, growth trend. Uh, I'm going to turn to inequality in a little bit. 
Now, this uh, uh, um, evolution of the Chilean economy has been accompanied by an increase in inequality. Here you see the Gini coefficient, which is 56, which is a uh, fairly high in terms of Latin America. You could see the, uh, uh, the inequality related to profit share. Uh, this graph uh, that I'm uh, circling with my uh, pointer, it shows the, uh, the division of GDP in terms of profits and, and the wage bill, that is wages multiplied by employment. Here, I have only the profit share. And you, if you see this, you can, you look, you can see that during the Awen and Frey years, uh, surprisingly enough, there was a decline in the profit share which tended to increase under uh, left-wing governments such as uh, Lagos and uh, Bachelet, which from my point of view means that these so-called left-wing governments really continued uh, pushing uh, or uh, defending or developing the Pinochet uh, model, or if they did some reforms, they weren't very uh, really very deep, uh, deep reforms. And the profit share is tied to natural resources. So this is an economy where you have a natural resource uh, base that's very important. This translates into profits and profits translate into inequality. And I'm gonna show you some graph in terms of inequality. One last uh, thing that I wanted to mention, if you look at the second graph, uh, this shows the profit share and copper prices and copper pro and copper prices increased uh, in the 2000s because there was a big uh, commodity boom in the um, in um, at the global level. Uh, this commodity boom increasing copper prices translating into profits and obviously part of this was also captured by the military the rents. This is a graph that shows income inequality, and it shows you the share of 1% of uh, 0, 0.10% and 0.01% richer uh, in income between 2005, 2010. That is, for example, the blue uh, column shows uh, how much of the income that is Earn in Chile is obtained by the 1%, and the 1% gets 30% of total income, and the 0.01%, they get 10% of the income, which is huge, which is much higher than the one, let's say, for Germany, 12% versus 5 versus 2.3%. Wealth inequality is about the same. 1% of the highest, uh, 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 the people that have the highest wealth has 17% of the wealth, 5% has 42.67%, and the 10 highest percent has more than half of the wealth, uh, uh, have more than half of the wealth inequality. And this wealth inequality is tied in a little bit to, uh, in some way to the structure of production, as I mentioned before, where do uh, 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 the percentage of profits go? And the percentage of profits partly, partly, partly goes to mining and partly of uh, that, uh, a part of that uh, went to the military for a long time. Now the, the law is, is, is under review and has been, um, um, will, will, uh, has, been um, uh, uh, has been eliminated or will be eliminated very shortly. And it goes to construction and real estate, and it goes to finance, to financial activities. And the fact that you have an increasing uh, profit share, uh, an economy that's going to profits, and this goes to mining, constructions, and real estate, and finance, uh, is the, it reveals in a certain way the development model of, uh, of Chile. If you look, for example, manufacturing, the percentage of profits or agriculture, which are the productive sectors besides mining, they capture uh, a much smaller share of profits uh, and obviously also on wages. 
the highest wages are paid by the uh, uh, financial sector. And besides the high wealth and income inequality and the decline in uh, GDP per capita growth trend, there is a third, I think, stylized fact that it's important to highlight uh, in the case of Chile, and that's the increase in debt. Uh, this is, and, and when I say increase in debt, it's mainly the increase in private debt. This is a graph uh, taken, um, constructed on the basis of data from the Central Bank of Chile that shows uh, debt as a percentage of GDP by households, by general government, and by the non-financial corporate sector on the left-hand side. If you look on the left-hand side, here and I'm, I'm using my pointer, the, uh, in 2020, the uh, uh, debt or the non-financial corporate sector, that is firms, uh, uh, reached about 120% of GDP. If you compare it with other developing economies, Asian economies, it's a little bit below what China. Chile is, in fact, uh, the private sector, one of the most indebted em emerging market economies in the world. If you look at the, at the, uh, at the public sector, the, high, the debt is not very high. It's about 27%. This is what everyone complains about. But if you look at the private sector, households have a debt that's uh, close to about 50% of GDP. And that reveals the fact that a lot of people, because wages are so low and they're not earning um, their profits and income go to a, a, a certain segment of the population, which are, is the, those that earn or that have the highest income and that are at the highest income brackets, the rest of the population in order to afford that consumerism, which is Pinochet's creator, creation, have to incur into debt. So I would say that the legacy of uh, the Pinochet regime and the legacy of uh, the, uh, the, the, the governments of the Concertacion that followed and that in a certain way solidified uh, the Pinochet model is a declining rate of growth, uh, a, a structure of production very biased towards natural services, an increase in the concentration of profits, and, in, and high inequality, and an increase in debt as a percentage of GDP. And the big question that certainly the, uh, the, the one has to ask, are these going to be structural features of the Chilean economic model in the future, or can the reforms that are being trying to push through, let's say, uh, a change in the constitution, through the revolt, the, the uh, social outbreak that has to do a lot with debt uh, uh, under uh, 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 declining income, higher concentration of property, higher concentration of wealth and income, uh, can actually reverse and, and change this development model. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. And so now we are gonna have questions. What I'm gonna do is we're all in here. I'm gonna, even that they're, they're, I'm sure we're not gonna have any Zoom bombing at this point. So I'm gonna allow participants to uh, unmute themselves, which uh, you were so far forbidden. So anybody now, can sort of uh, unmute themselves. And so, uh, Fernando, I don't know if you want to uh, coordinate this, but we can sort of open up for, uh, for questions for both Michael and, and Stephen. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a couple of things that you can do. You can either raise your hands or just leave your question on the chat and we can go over the question. Yes, so let me, everyone can see the chat now. Okay. So everybody can sort of write. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to open right the floor for questions for our guest. And I have to say thank you to, to you both for a couple, you know, fantastic presentations. So. I'm glad that there was a sort of a connection with the history of Different kinds of ghosts, but we yeah, talk of. 
we have talked about the ghosts of uh, the new neoliberalism in Chile. So, questions, please. Uh, yeah, Baliska, uh, let me ask you to unmute. Hola. <laughs> Greetings from New Zealand. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the incredible presentations. And I think they really relate very well uh, in, in a very interesting manner, uh, the reference of uh, Michael to uh, Guzman, et cetera, and the issue of the ghost. I wanted to ask a question that I think in some ways is addressed to the two of you, to Esteban and, and Michael, uh, because um, in my own study and, and research on neoliberalism, uh, one of the aspects that has been highlighted by different intellectuals, including David Harvey that has studied this so well, right? In, especially in relation to our countries in Latin America, Argentina and Chile, um, is the change that has taken place in the from the liberal to the neoliberal, basically, mentality in economics. So one of the burning questions that I have is, what is the plan that the economic elites, the social elites have with respect to the development of our economies in Latin America, in this case, with Chile? Because this, uh, this doesn't seem to be sustainable in the short, medium, long term. And the uprising in Chile seems to be just the first of many events to come because we later have Peru, for instance, right? So is, what is the plan? What is the economic sustainability plan that the economic, financial, social elites have because as you have said, Esteban, in a very, very clear manner in your data, that the, there is a decline in growth, that there is an increase in the dependency on natural resources, that there is a decline in the industrialization, and there is an increase in financialization. Basically, what you are synopsis is telling us is that we are becoming unsustainable, right? Because the situation of the financialization in, in the developing, the third, the, the global south cannot be compared to the financialization that has taken place, for instance, in England, right? In which when you have really the monopoly in the management of the global economies, and they are the fundamental role in the global banks, the monetary fund, et cetera. But a country like Chile, right? In South America, third world still, et cetera. How can we are going to counterbalance the fact that actually our natural resources are more increasingly in private hands? Ponce Leru for me is the most paradigmatic example of the insustainability of the, finance, of the privatization of their natural resources with the lithium, right? And the fact that there are studies that copper is only gonna last for another 10 years. And in, the, in, in, in currently, for instance, China is buying a lot of our copper and they are storing copper. They are not using it right now, but storing it because they know that is, we are running out of that. So when I think about all this is, what's the plan? What is the plan, right? Because obviously this is unsustainable. I would like to understand that from an economic point of view, from the mentality of those who are actually directing these policies. And I think that Michael and you can probably reply from your own perspectives, right? Since you have been studying the, the ideological, the mentality processes, Michael with, uh, with Guzman, et cetera. So I leave the question. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh... Uh, let me let me add. Uh, so can we accumulate one more? We have one from Fernando Villanueva. So thanks, Michael and Esteban. I'm going to read it for your presentations. I would like to ask uh, in uh, uh, in which degree we can divide the neoliberal. Uh, sorry, bear with me. They divide the neoliberal administration into pre and post dictatorship, especially in the first democratic government, based on the distinction that Ricardo French Davis. 
uh, makes. In the 1990s, Chile implemented capital controls, uh, some superficial reforms to the labor uh, legislation, rises in minimum wage and tax reform uh, in the first democratic government. Uh, in the 90s until the Asian crisis, which is 97 for those that don't know, um, Chile exhibited the highest GDP growth rates in their history and also an increase in labor income share. What do you think that makes this difference of the 90s in relation to the poor performance uh, in the dictatorship and the relative uh, stagnation post-Asian crisis? Uh, so I think that that's more of an economic question. So, um, so let's accumulate those and, and then we'll have a, a, another round, I suppose. You know, please, if you have more questions, you can either you know, raise your hands, as Fernando said, or you can put it here in the chat and we'll read them. Uh, Michael, Esteban, uh, if you want to. Esteban, maybe you can you can start since both questions have a, a bit more of an economic bent. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll start. Uh, the, uh, the Regarding what's the plan, I don't know if there's a plan. I don't know. Uh, I think a lot. I, I want of, to make a joke. Plan Latin America. Yeah, you know, we had planning, but you know, it's Latin America, so I would say it's always improvisation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the the. I I think the, for the most part, the what uh, economists and what uh, policy ma makers were counting on was high rates of growth, and that the distribution would occur by trickle down through high rates of growth without really any major changes in uh, so structure, any major, major changes in distribution or any major changes in property. And that hasn't happened. And I think that's one of the key reasons why there was, there, there was this outburst. People are still discontent. And this idea of consumerism, of, uh, of the fact uh, that some people can afford a lot of things and others cannot, is a big source of discontent. So this idea of uh, Pinochet's consumerism is, in a way, uh, at the root, let's say, of this uh, social uh, outbreak that took place in October 2019. Uh, I think the only plan, uh, uh, from my point of view, is to increase taxes on the, on the rich. I think there's a lot of loopholes in, uh, in Chile relative to, to the rich, and I can mention one loophole. It's very easy in Chile to evade uh, inheritance uh, taxes. If you have a family member, relative, let's say a father or mother, who owns a, uh, an apartment, and uh, that person is about to, is very old and it's about to uh, soon, you'd say, pass away. And you have to take a, what's called effective possession of, the, of this uh, apartment or building. And you have to pay inheritance taxes. Before this happens, you create a society, an anonymous society. And through an anonymous society, that it can be an, uh, a firm, it can be a means of production, it can be an apartment, becomes, becomes actually the property, not of a natural person, but becomes the property of a society that never dies. And that's a, a way, I mean, a lawyer told me this, through which you, for example, can evade inheritance taxes and can maintain sort of inequality and, and so on. And for, uh, for a long time, uh, people, uh, entrepreneurs did not have to pay taxes or have very low taxes. And a lot of that, that, uh, those policies that were implemented actually by the Pinochet governments, because they thought that it would go into investment, it went to conspicuous consumption. It went to uh, you know, strengthen your grip on, on, on property, on wealth and on, on income rather than to go into investment. The same thing happens with the, uh, with, the, um, with the pension funds, this idea that people would save and you go to investment, but actually it went to enrich some individuals and partly the financial market. So I think you need a real tax reform and there's a lot of opposition to that. 
uh, when the constitution was voted, uh, the let's say the the neighbor the neighborhoods that uh, voted against the constitution wanted to maintain the Pinochet constitution were the wealthy neighborhoods, which concentrate actually the power and the income, and, and that's that's a real problem. The other problem is the intervention of the state. Uh, there is a uh, there is a belief in Chile that the in, uh, the state should intervene should intervene through micro interventions in sectors trying to uh, fix price distortions, not macro interventions because they are associated with nationalizations, they are associated with inflations and with the ghost, the Chile ghost of civil war that in Chile there was never such thing, but uh, uh, that people uh, uh, attribute to the to the Allende years. Industrial policy, for example, should be uh, a, an important an important uh, pillar of any government. Should be an important uh, uh, part, an important policy uh, policy objective. But uh, it, it it has never happened. And uh, there there are two, for example, two ministers of economics here. This is the minister of finance. Which the stability and the minister of Eco uh, the ministry of the economy that uh, takes care of all the productive uh, you know aspects, uh, small and medium sized firms, productivity, and, and the, the important ministers, the ministry of finance, the ones that take care of of, uh, of of stability, and the other thing is the budget deficit that now with the uh, I think with the with the effects of the COVID has really it was really uh, increased the debt of Chile is going to increase. But before the, uh, the, uh, the, the events of October 2019, uh, uh, having a budget deficit that was 30% of your GDP was, was a sacrilege. Uh, and, and the same economies that said that when the, uh, the, the, after the, the riots of, uh, of October 19, they said, well, we can increase our, our, our budget deficit. The fact that students have a giant debt is uh, for my, from my point of view, completely unfounded. Uh, so there, there are a lot of, of uh, problems. The, there's a problem with natural resources. There is a problem with drought. There are a lot of structural problems with the Chilean economy that are just not being addressed. Will, will this change? I don't know. Right now, um, I think there's a lot of people trying to fight to keep what they can of the existing model. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 it's a very divided society. There are uh, 11 or 12 presidential candidates. This is a country of 18 million, million people. So how are you going to you know, progress within, uh, within those uh, parameters or within this context? I'm not, not sure. If I may sort of add on, on the questions that were there, but for Michael, so so it, it, do you think, you know, so you're talking about Guzman, who was central for the constitutional sort of straitjacket in which the Mexican society, not just the economy, was sort of, a, uh, how much do you think what Esteban alluded to, the continuity, which you alluded to, the continuity to some extent of the Pinochet policies in, you know, in the post-Pinochet uh, era have to do with that, with that constitutional sort of grip and you know, because, you know, from what Stephen is talking, Stephen doesn't mention the constitutional sort of stuff. So, so uh, how much of, of, of uh, you know, you think that comes from, from, uh, from that constitutional sort of, uh, you know, grip that, uh, that uh, you know, Guzman was central for? Right. It's an interesting question. I, I mean, I think that the, the Constitution played a really important role uh, at first during the dictatorship because it was one of the key vehicles for institutionalizing the regime and for uh, kind of securing its legitimacy in time. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that I was trying to point out, um, you know, Waleska, you brought up the ideological and cultural aspect is that there was really kind of, a, and st to use the term that Steve Stern, uh, you know, uses in one of the titles for his books, uh, you know, a battle for hearts and minds of people and kind of, you know, the idea was to create this society of citizen consumers based on a blind belief in, in markets and, you know, sort of blindly believing that they would contain their own corrective factors, et cetera. And, 
and the con so the constitution was kind of just one one part of it, but the, but it was something that, interestingly enough, from the very beginning of the Pinochet regime was something that was talked about. I think it was maybe even a month after the coup, there was already a team of people coming together to think about creating this document, but it was really Guzman who was there kind of pushing behind the scenes for this to happen, um, it, you know, over time. The constitution itself, if you look at it, has, you know, and it's been talked about a lot, and a lot of non-democratic features. There's uh, mistrust in universal suffrage uh, there, which was embodied early on in the binomial system, which was subsequently overturned. Uh, there was the idea of the military kind of playing a supervisory role over the democracy through a number of mechanisms. Um, and there's a, a real heavy ev emphasis in the constitution on the individual and rights to property and so forth. So kind of that consumerist aspect is even codified within uh, the document. Um, but I I've wondered myself over time, you know, given that there have been so many moments in which there have been smaller reforms to the constitution, if really what we're seeing now happening in Chile is about the constitution, or if it, it's it's really more about, I think as Esteban was pointing out really well, about the, the things that are affecting people's lives, the debt that people are in, the lack of, you know, access to good health care, the lack of access to quality education because of a hyper privatized uh, system and so forth. So all of that, I think, uh, you know, and some of the things that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that haven't been as much in the discussion, rights of indigenous peoples, women's rights today, you know, being National Women's Day, all these things sort of converged in an interesting way um, in the, with the with the revolt. So it's, it's hard to say that it's really about the constitution, but I think in a political sense, it, the constitution is quite symbolic. So even if it's been amended many times, um, still it's getting rid of that constitution as kind of in a way putting a nail in the coffin uh, of the dictator in a certain sense. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, what's, what's that? Sorry, sorry. Can I just interject very briefly? Sure. I, I have to go. I think it's very interesting what you both have said. So basically, Michael, the homo neoliberales or homo economicos in some ways is proving to become basically inco incompetent because the trickle down economy is not working, the indebtedness mm -hmm. is in there. So basically, as Hannah Arendt used to say, when you have a system of like this, which is fascism in, in its nature, basically, it's corroding from within. So the uprising in, in that way is just going to be like the bullet in mm -hmm. that respect, because this is unsustainable. If the people is indebted, they're not going to be able to be good consumers. So the, the machinery is going to stop. Uh, and I just wanted to say that because actually I feel optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> because it really looks like since there is no plan, it means that whatever plan can come up uh, from the people, has better chances of succeeding because they don't have any coherence in the plan or the, and the inexistence of a plan, if, if, mm -hmm. if I may say. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for, for interrupting. Thank Great you. Great to see you. Uh, Michael. Ahead, Fernando, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, going back to the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned it, right? The um, protests in October right, mm -hmm. the, the 18 -0. So I was wondering, one of the um, topics of the class, the, the thing that we have been discussing throughout the semester uh, is the role played by memory narratives and um, the connection between the subjective or the subjectivity part connected to these memory narratives and how can you uh, make or uh, introduce changes in public opinion, right? just by manipulating this type of narratives. So what I have in mind, as you know, probably by now is the definition by Steve Stern of memory knots. So my question is how this 18-0 um, has affected memory narratives and the past, and what are the main narratives that are playing out now in Chile? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. So, I mean, maybe for anybody who isn't familiar with, uh, with Steve Stern's term, a memory knot is kind of, it, it could be a number of things. It could be an event, it could be a moment, it could be a place, it could be a happening, but it's basically something that shakes 
everyone out of their complacency and either forces it forces us to confront the past in some way, either to remember, you know, you, you have to sort of make a decision when you're confronted with it. You either remember or you forget. Um, and, and so, I, I mean, I think what you're referring to is in the beginning of the talk, I was, you know, talking about how sort of in a natural way, the revolt of uh, October, 18th of October brought back a lot of memories. I, I think just because of the scenes and the images that people were seeing, imagery is such an important, I mean, all the uh, commentators and philosophers, uh, you know, from way back uh, always comment on how memory is imagistic in nature and things uh, stick in our minds. So, I mean, the, the water cannons, the detentions, uh, you know, the declaration of a state of emergency, you know, all of these things were sort of activated in, in that moment. And I think, especially for the, for the older generation, they remembered, but even, I mean, the younger generations are all well aware of these things because they've been handed down. But I, th I think actually what we saw then, um, it, in a way it has to do with the past because the past is always there kind of haunting and being reactivated. But there were also a lot of new memory knots that were created by, uh, by that event. I mean, I, I think if we look back on it, certain images definitely stand out. The destruction of the Metro, the eye, you know, the, all of these images that was even on the poster for this event, the, the eye uh, being, becoming such, a, such an emblem of the human rights violations that occurred, um, which I think has a great metaphorical quality to it as well, um, you know, because people being blinded and sort of the, the Power, state power not wanting to acknowledge and for people to see and to name uh, the, the violations that were occurring. I think the image of the Mapuche flag flying over uh, Plaza Dignidad is another memory knot that, that really speaks. Um, and, and even things like uh, Un Violador en Tu Camino, uh, this uh, performance, you know, that uh, speaking of the patriarchal patriarchal state and uh, the rebellion of, uh, you know, the, the vindication of gender rights and uh, so forth was sort of went all around the world as well. So the, 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 the thing I would say is that it's memory traveled kind of in an interesting multi-directional way and the memory knots, you know, kind of moved from present to past and past to present and even beyond Chile because the, in a way this was a Chilean moment but it was also a part of a global moment. Um, so, I, so I think when you're thinking about memory and how it works, uh, you know, that's another important factor to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. So I think we have another question. Uh, yeah, I think we have time probably to one more question and then, uh, you know, uh, we probably should be winding uh, up. We have one question from Jordan Isaacs. Uh, Jordan, would you want to ask your question yourself or do you want me to read over? I don't care. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so uh, we were talking about like all these like false memory narratives and I was just wondering like how can like the truth be like heard over these false narratives like that are spoken about? Like how do you think that like the truth can be heard over these false narratives? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think the simple answer is it just needs to keep being spoken <laughs> over and over again in many ways and many forms. Um, I, my, my project, I, I mean, I know the, the students in the class read some excerpts from the book. And I think one of, the, one of the things that I was trying to do in the project was really to bring to the foreground some of these narratives that are, that are not truthful um, or that manipulate uh, the truth. I, it, in the beginning, when I started the project, people sort of wondered why I was even doing it in the first place, because uh, the, you know, the people would say, well, we know that these are just a bunch of lies, so why even bother studying these things? Uh, but I think that there is importance in doing it, uh, sort of, because, because the, the memory narrative, uh, sometimes a, a lie is not just a lie. It's, it's, it's overlaid with a lot of different elements, some of which for some people might ring as true and, and, and others not. And so it, it's really a very complicated Kind of, kind of cocktail, I think, that needs to be kind of undone and deconstructed. And I felt like there was really value in showing kind of how these lies get proliferated in many different spaces and by many different actors uh, across a society. Um, 
Uh, but you know, just to go to go back to your question, I mean, I think it's uh, you know may sound a little cliche, but uh, it's really, and it was one of the points of my talk. I mean, younger people are really breaking with this in very radical ways. The example that I gave was a less radical break. It was somewhere in the middle. Uh, you know, when you're talking about Jaime Guzman's nephew, but some of the other. Um, things that we're seeing on the artistic scene, on the cultural scene in Chile, uh, you know, are really foregrounding this, th these lies. Yes. So, yeah, uh, that, uh, the, the uh, question about false narratives, I think is a very, very important question. Uh, the answer that I would give is you have to deconstruct the interpretations of the past. And Chile has a history going at least to the uh, 19th century or earlier of providing false narratives about the evolution of the country, about the people, about the expectations. Uh, there's a famous book in Chile that was written in the 19th century, uh, which is called uh, Martin Rivas. And Martin Rivas uh, tells the story of a young man that uh, comes from a poor family uh, that comes from, uh, you know, the countryside, marries, goes to Santiago, marries into, uh, uh, falls in love with uh, 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 a young woman of a wealthy family. The father is thrilled. He gets into the wealthy family and everything and ends up honky dory. Uh, if you read the same type of narrative in Europe, let's say the the, the black and the red about Julien Sorel, he was killed. He was basically killed because he tried to break social class boundary. Uh, in, in Chile during the Allende years, uh, it was, oh, there were also false narratives that if there was a military intervention, military in Chile that did not torture because there were military, Chilean militaries. They were going just to do the coup and then turn over the uh, power to the civilians. And when torture is, uh, the, the torture started to happen and no one, they just, there was a complete denial of it. Even the president that took over in 1990, Alwin, had, uh, there was a report that was uh, written uh, on, the, uh, on the on the tortures, and when he he was asked uh, when he when the report came out and he was a president, he says, "Really, wow, wow. It was, it's really shocking. I didn't know this." And of course, he knew. The lie of the civil war is another false narrative that there was a military intervention because otherwise Chile would have gone into a civil war. A civil war you need two armies, you need transportation, you need hostels, you need doctors. There's never a civil war with just one army. So I think that's, uh, uh, that uh, it's very important to, to deconstruct the, uh, the, the past, I think. And one of the main uh, ways that a false narrative is implemented in Chile is through the, the class system, which is a main, I think, stumbling block to uh, social and economic progress. Thank you. And the same thing happened with the, uh, with the, uh, by the way, with the, with the out, with the social outbreak in 2019, because those things did not happen in Chile. They could happen in Ecuador. They could happen in Bolivia because they're less developed. But in Chile, no, because Chile was an oasis. And when you know, the things, this, the outbreak happened, then uh, the people that were in the high income brackets, the wealthy people, they blamed foreign terrorists that were doing this. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much to Michael and to Esteban. Um, I think uh, this was very good for, you know, not just our students, but there's also some colleagues and, you know, and some people also from the outside community. So we thank you so much for taking time to coming and talking to us about, uh, you know, the Chilean experience. And I think uh, that, you know, uh, we're all a little bit more enriched by that. Hopefully we can think about some of these issues that were raised about Chile, about uh, other societies, including our society here, that also has to do with 
uh, you know, reconstructed memories and the way we sort of, uh, you know, think about uh, what's the tr truth and what is going on. And we also have people in protests on the street. Um, so, um, so again, uh, I, I thank everybody and, um, and I'll see you, uh, the students, uh, in the second half of the class. Uh, we're going to be on, on our regular Zoom uh, you know, uh, I would say in a few minutes. Fernando, I don't know if you want to say something. I just want to say thank you, um, to both of you, Michael and Steven, for allowing us um, to be part of this collective reflection. We will continue the conversation with our students later, but again, it was a great. Um, and I hope that social sciences and humanities, right, or economics and culture can dialogue, right? In this, type, in this type of manner more often. So it's a really unique opportunity. So thank you for that. Thanks to both of you for inviting us and great to, great to meet you, Esteban. <laughs> Same here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for the questions and your, your patience. Yes, and thank you to uh, the public. <clears throat> Right. Well, right. thank you, everybody. Uh, there'll be a link. So we, we filmed this. The Zoom is out there. So I'm going to put it on the blog. So everybody, you know, uh, you know, will be able to see it again if you want to. See you all, guys. What time should we be on the Zoom? Like 10 minutes break. Uh, uh, I, I said 15 minutes break. Okay. This is long, so, so think 15 minutes and we'll see you on the other Zoom. I'm going to get out and in in the other Zoom. Uh, around nine. Yes, around nine. Yeah, we'll thank you. Shorter, and we promise a shorter sort of, uh, you know, second half. <laughs>